the U.S. is a net importer. We buy more than we sell. So when you have a cheap dollar, okay, a Boeing aircraft or General Electric uh, wind turbine gets a little less expensive, but all the stuff we buy gets more expensive because we're paying for it in cheaper dollars. And that's what the central bankers really want. They want those price increases to feed through the supply chain and try to create inflation because governments around the world are desperate to get inflation. So that's the real reason they do it. And it can have a short-term impact. It can help exports a little bit. It can give you a little bit of lift. But the problem is it comes at the expense of the trading partners. This is just classic beggar line neighbor uh, devaluations. That's what currency wars are. So it can help individual country growth, but it does nothing for world growth. The world is no better off. Mm -hmm. One country is a little better off, another country is worse off. So the other metaphor I've used is, uh, you know, you've got four soldiers and they're fighting and it's a hot day and they get a break and they've got one canteen and they're all really thirsty. What do you do in that situation? you pass the canteen. In other words, everybody would like to drink the whole canteen, but you take a sip, you hand it to your mate, he takes a sip and so forth. And that's the way the currency wars have gone. 2009 was the, the day of the cheap yuan. Remember 2009, 2010, Secretary Geithner couldn't get out of bed without complaining yeah. about Chinese currency manipulation. 2011, the dollar hit an all time low on a couple of indices. That was the cheap dollar. 2013, along comes Abenomics, and one of his three arrows was a cheap yen. All of a sudden, the yen's at 120, 124. Japan got a little bit of a lift. So who's suffering the whole time? Europe. Europe had the strong currency, two recessions in four years. So finally, 2015, it was Draghi's turn. Well, 2000, June 2014, they launched negative interest rates. In January 2015, they launched European QE. So, so you're going from China, US, Japan, Europe, everybody's passing the canteen. But the world is still stuck in basically depressionary growth. It's not, we don't have negative growth, but we have below trend growth. So there is no way out of it. You, you, right, so right now, my forecast, I actually said this a couple of months ago, is that look for uh, a stronger yen, stronger euro, cheaper dollar, cheaper yuan. That has played out with a couple speed bumps. The dollar got a big lift because of Brexit, uh, and Europe, the euro went down a little bit also because of Brexit. But the yen went from 124 to 104, it backed up, 103 actually backed up a little bit. Uh, but we, we do have a strong yen. Uh, all these people who expect Japan to intervene in currency markets, don't hold your breath. They've been warned, I would say threatened, by Jack Lew and Christine Lagarde, don't you dare mm -hmm. intervene in currency markets. You're just, you, you, know, you had three years with a cheap yen. You didn't make the structural reforms. You didn't know, do what you needed to do. Too bad for you, we're taking the canteen back. So, so the point to your, your, to, to your main question, Grant, is that they don't have a logical conclusion. There are only two ways out of a currency war. One is systemic reform, a kind of Bretton Woods or mm -hmm. Plaza Accord where all the major powers sit down and just say, here's the new deal. The other one is systemic collapse. I expect collapse um, because there's no consensus on a way out of it. There's no political will behind structural reform. Uh, I don't see the leadership, you know, in, uh, you know, in 1944, you had John Maynard Keynes. In 1985, you had James Baker. In the 1990s, you had Bob Rubin. These were, you know, whether the Democrats or Republicans, these, this was leadership. I don't see that kind of leadership yeah. today. I see a lot of denial. I don't see the political will behind structural reform. So I would expect a collapse of the system. Well, it's interesting you say, you know, we, because of all the bailouts, we don't know what a systemic collapse looks like. I actually have a pretty good idea of what it looks like because there was, everyone focuses on 2008 and, you know, U.S. economists call it the Great Recession. You go abroad, they call it the uh, global financial crisis, the GFC for yeah. sure, whatever you want to call it. Um, but we had another one that was actually potentially worse or as bad uh, in 1998. And that was the Asian financial crisis, started in 97, worked its way around the world, ended up in Russia, and then landed in my lap at long-term capital management. I was the general counsel of that hedge fund in Greenwich uh, that got bailed out by Wall Street, although I'd like to remind people they didn't bail us out, they bailed themselves out. Because, sure. Yeah, no, Wall Street bailed itself out. I, yeah. I always say, you know, hey, we owed, we owed, on paper, we owed Wall Street a trillion dollars in derivatives trades. If we had failed, meaning filed for bankruptcy, and we had a bankruptcy team ready to file those papers in, in the Cayman Islands because we were a Cayman fund. Um, I said, well, we, I would have just slept in the next day. It's like, yeah, it's out of my hand. We filed for bankruptcy, good luck getting your money. Wall Street bailed themselves out because they didn't want that trillion dollars of derivatives positions dumped on them. Then they would have to turn to the market and yeah. dump it. We were hours away from the closure of every major market in the world. That's not an exaggeration. Uh, Greenspan testified to that. Uh, Ruben said the same thing. 
it would have started in Tokyo, gone through London, ended up in New York. But every stock exchange, bond market in the world would have been shut down, at least temporarily, to deal with it. That's how bad it would have been. Lehman would have failed in 98. Forget, right. forget about it. Right. They, were always, they were always the weakest link right. in the chain. It was easy to call it 2008 because <laughs> they almost failed in 98. But the point is, okay, so we moved $4 billion in cash in about three days. If you think of it as a private deal, $4 billion all cash, no due diligence, wired the money. That's kind of how <laughs> the sense of urgency. And so we filmed the runways, we brought it in for landing, you know, nobody, the plane didn't crash or break up on the runway, but it was that close. So when 2008 came along, I just felt I was watching a movie I had already seen. It was like a rerun right. for me. Uh, and you're right, 2008 was even bigger, potentially more. We were, if not hours, maybe days away from the sequential collapse of every bank in the world, and starting with... Uh, you know, Bear had already gone out, uh, Fannie, Freddie, Lehman, AIG, Morgan Stanley would have been next, then Goldman, then Merrill's City, yep. yeah, Mer et cetera. They, we, were, we were days away from that. And again, I think Andrew O'Sorkin did a good job yep. in his book. So, so this isn't, we're not looking at strike two in a baseball metaphor, we're looking at strike three because 98 was strike one, 2008 was strike two. Now we're looking at strike three. The next one is going to be worse. So what? So I think we've, we've come extremely close. I think people are overly complacent. Just because we, bail, we, we managed to pull off bailouts and the world didn't come to an end, don't assume it wasn't close and don't assume it won't happen again. Sure, but, no, there's, sure. but there's one very important difference. In 1998, Wall Street bailed out a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks bailed out Wall Street. In 2018, let's say, keep up the 10-year tempo, who's going to bail out the central banks. And all we do is we move the problem to a different balance sheet. Now the problem is on the central bank balance sheet because the Fed printed $3.4 trillion of new money since 2008. Their balance sheet was $800 billion. Now it's at $4.2 trillion, give or take, so $3.4 uh, you know, trillion of new money. But it's nine years on. Yeah. They haven't normalized. If they had somehow got their balance sheet back to $800 billion, I'd say, okay, you guys could do that again. But when you're at four trillion, what are you going to do when the next crisis hits? Which could be soon, by the way. Go to eight trillion, twelve trillion. Now, some people say, "Yeah, what's the problem? Just print more money." I have my doubts about that. But so, who can bail out central banks? The answer is the IMF, because they have the only clean balance sheet left in the world. The Fed is leveraged about 113 to one, um, with a duration mismatch. So they look like a really bad hedge fund. And again, I've spoken to central bankers who say, "Well, who cares? Central banks don't need capital." A, a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve said that to me. She said, central banks don't need capital. I said, well, that's one point of view, but we'll see. <laughs> exactly, we'll see. Um, but there's, there's sort of an invisible, uh, hard to define confidence boundary. And when you cross that confidence boundary and everyday citizens just wake up and say, you know what, I'm, I'm checking out of this system. You tell me it's all good, I don't believe you anymore. Yeah. And get me some gold because I know that the gold will be around, et cetera. That's an instantaneous loss of confidence in the dollars. That's what I mean by collapse. Now, I, now, just to be clear, I don't think we'll all be living in caves, right. eating canned goods, you know, lighting fires with with rocks and, and twigs. Uh, you know, life will go on. You know, this, but it'll but it'll be different. The dollar will maybe be like the Mexican peso in the sense of being a, a local currency that you get when you go to the United yeah. States, but no longer the world currency. They'll try to bail it out with SDRs, the special drawing rights. If it works, if the SDR bailout works, it's only because nobody understands it, or like maybe there were 100 people in the world who really understand. I've spoken to PhD monetary economists, like, like people right in the field with PhDs from Harvard who can't give you a straight explanation of what an SDR is. So, uh, so if it works, it'll only be because nobody gets it. But I have a feeling that because of social media, because of, you know, interviews like the ones you do grant just because of different means of communication that people will get it and they'll run for gold because it's money good and so that uh, and then and then you get into coercion shutting down banks closing ATMs or maybe reprogramming repro ATMs everyone can have three hundred dollars a day for gas and groceries but no more um, recently the SEC has changed the rules for money market funds you know I, I meet people everywhere and you say well, how much money you got or where do you have your money in? Probably a better way to put it. And they go, I got, I got a lot. Of, I got money in stocks, money in bonds, money in real estate, and money in the money market funds. I say, no, you don't. You have stocks, bonds, and real estate. You don't have money in anything. That's yeah. not money. Oh, I can sell it and get the money. Really? Uh, maybe not. Maybe they'll close the New York Stock Exchange. But anyway, they have new rules on money market funds where money market funds can suspend redemptions. Now that has always been true of hedge funds. I've never seen a hedge fund right. offering document that didn't have that in there. 
But people think they can call Charles Schwab or you know, Merrill Lynch or Bank of America, instruct the broker to sell the units and the money's in the bank the next day. They're gonna wake up one day and make that phone call and find out, no, we've, we've suspended redemptions, we'll get back to you. You can't get your money. And oh, by the way, the day that will happen is the same day you want your money the most. Yeah, and those, it's, condi it's conditionally correlated. So this is, so you'll still have money for gas and groceries and your kids will still go to school and you'll still have food on the table, but you won't be able to get your money. The IMF will be flooding the zone with trillions of SDRs. The dollar will be greatly devalued relative to SDRs. It'll be like Mexican pesos and, and it'll be a very different world.